First Chronicles chapter 21 is a story where David was tempted to uh, give in to his pride. I don't know about you, you may not have an issue with pride, but I do. I have, I've battled it, and it's probably manifested itself in my life in so many different ways. Uh, pride is not just, uh, comes in one way, but it, it shapes himself in, in many ways, sometimes in your actions, sometimes in your reactions, sometimes even in how Satan brings temptations against you, it's where you're vulnerable or where you're very weary, and that's how those things happen. And David found himself weak in this area, and in this particular time, he sinned. And the consequence of his sin was not only against him, but it was as king of Israel, it happened to all the people of Israel. So they had to pay for his sin. That's just a warning to you. Sometimes if you're thinking, well, it's my life and it's my sin and I'll just do whatever I want, be very careful. Be very careful because there are times that, yes, you will be affected by your sin, But just please understand that others will be affected by it as well. And God gave uh, David the consequences of it. And he would not be the only one that would have to pay the consequences. Israel would. But God gave David the opportunity to say, how would you like for these consequences to come? In other words, it was kind of a multiple choice question and answer. He got to choose A, B, or C. And really, the choice that he did was to put himself into the hands of God for God to choose whatever would be right with him, whatever would be right. And death came, 70,000 were killed. And the angel of the Lord was standing over Jerusalem, and David saw him. What, how frightening that must have been. Because he saw the angel of the Lord, and it was pictured as having a sword drawn from his sheath. And God stopped the angel of the Lord. Now, God is God. He's on the throne in heaven. He's sovereign. There is no other power other than him. And he can do whatsoever he so chooses. There are sometimes he will allow things to happen. As I said earlier in the, in the Gulf Coast today, it will rain on the just and the unjust. It's not just that bad people will pay the consequences. Really, everyone in that region will, will have the the hardship of it. But yet, even then, even then, God will say, I will stay my hand. I will only allow it to a certain degree. And Romans 8, 28 will be activated. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So please understand, God is still sovereign no matter what. So as it began to happen and the consequence came and the angel of the Lord is there and he's got his sword pulled, God told him to stop and it was pause. And David's watching this and and the, the, the word comes that an offering needs to be given. And, and where the angel was is the place where Ornan, O-R-N-A-N, was, was threshing his wheat. And he was there, and David was to go to him to make an offering there. So when we get to uh, 1 Chronicles chapter number 21, let's begin in uh, verse number 21. So David came to Ornan, and Ornan looked and saw David, and he went from the threshing floor and bowed before David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar on it to the Lord. You shall grant it to me at the full price that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. But Ornan said to David, Take it to yourself. Let my Lord the king do what is good in his eyes. Look, I also give to you the oxen for burnt offerings, the threshing implements for wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I give it all. Verse 24 is where I want you to see, though. And King David said to Ornan, no, but I will surely buy it for the full price, for I will not take what is yours for the Lord. I will not take what is yours for the Lord nor offer burnt offerings with that which cost me nothing. 
David knew it was his sin that brought this on. It was his pride that brought this on. And 70,000 had died, and it could have been more. But God was being merciful. And he was not going to, in being obedient, he went to Ornan, but he was not going to let Ornan give the sacrifice for him. He said, if you would, let me buy it. I'll buy this from you, and I'll pay full price. I'll buy the land. I'll buy all the equipment that's on the land. I'll buy the animals. I'll buy the wheat. I'll take it all just the way it is. Ornan's like, oh, no, no. Take the implements. Use them for the wood to build the altar. Take the oxen. Slay them and let them be the burnt offering. And take the wheat. Folks, this is, his, this is his produce. This is his income for the year. He said, let it be a, a grain offering unto the Lord. I'll give it on your behalf for this great cause. David said, no. No. Look, I appreciate it. I'm grateful for your sacrifice. But I cannot let you pay my sacrifice. I cannot let you do my part. I must do this. I must pay in full. I love the attitude that he is saying. He is saying, Ornan, good man that you are, I appreciate it. But Ornan, only I can give for me. I must fulfill what has been placed upon me to do. In our world today, we live on the benefit of what others have done. We live in the land where everything is so absolutely amazing for us. We are the richest country in the world. We have more than any other people of any country in the world. We have the greatest health care of any country in the world. We are overflowed with affluence and blessings. And we cannot, though it has become acceptable, God help us, it has become acceptable for others to do so that we can benefit from. But that's not the way that it should be. It's not the way that God wants it. We, la we live in a land with so much, so very, very much, but we must not take that for granted. We must do our part too. Now listen to me. Listen plain. If you're a Christian, you are the beneficiary of what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary. On the body that was broken for you. The blood that was shed to cleanse you from your sins. That's what we're about to partake of here in the Lord's Supper. There's no way you can repay that. But Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable and perfect unto Him. I just want you to know there are so many things that we do that we place as a higher priority than Christ today. And God's telling us, no, we all must do our part. We all must give ourselves as living sacrifice. Nobody else can do our part for us. If you're looking for the preacher to do it for you, if you're looking for the staff or someone else to do it for you, if God has called you to minister, but you're looking for someone else to do your daily ministry for you, nobody else can do it. Nobody else can come and do your part. Everyone must do your part. Everyone must present your bodies holy unto Him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You for what You have done. Lord, and we are the recipients of Your love today. We're really never going to know this side of glory what it's like to 
to, to fully understand what you gave for us. But Lord, we do understand what we would be yielding to you, giving to you, sacrificing unto you. We do understand the cost of that. And yet, in your word, Jesus, Luke 9, 23, you said that if any man wants to follow you, he must take up his cross daily and follow you. If anyone wants to come after you, take up his cross daily. Living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. And Lord, be your disciple and follow you. Lord, nobody else can walk that mile for me. I've got to walk it myself. Father, help me, Lord. Help us all to do what you've laid before us. Let it be our glory as we yield it unto you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Every day when I travel to uh, work, I leave early in the morning. It's about a 35-minute drive. And when I, I, I normally listen to podcasts. And every Monday morning, there's one particular podcast I like to listen to. It comes in early in the morning, uh, and, and it, it kind of starts my week off right. It's someone that we as a staff, we have looked at. His name is Robbie Gallaty. He is a person that is uh, very much uh, learned on discipleship. And our responsibility is to go, therefore, and make disciples. So we're supposed to help others make disciples. So uh, I, I've been listening to this podcast and learning this, very much from it. But in the last four weeks, I haven't been able to get the podcast. I, pro I thought I had actually may have messed up. And, and I probably had unsubscribed from it or something. I didn't really know. But I've been following this church because, you see, when 18 months ago when COVID hit, by the way, none of us knew what to do. And we all kind of tried to face it and, and learn from it and, and do our best during these past 18 months. And, and this particular pastor, uh, his, his story is, is he went to his front porch and he spent 10 months on his front porch with the Lord. Well, come December, uh, when we, as our church here, COVID hit us and we had to shut down. At the end of the month, they were going to have to shut down too. They were in the hotbed uh, in, in Tennessee, and, and it was this, this place where COVID seemed to be doing the very most, okay? So as they were getting ready to shut down, God began to do a movement. And as God began to do a movement there, uh, it was a movement of churning his will uh, among the people. God began to revive his people. Now, there were some steps of faith that they had to take, and they did take. And by the way, if you're looking for God to make things easy for you and that you're not going to have to walk by faith, you're never going to learn that because we, uh, the Bible, by the way, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says the only way that we please God is by faith. So if you want everything in your life nice and orderly and neat and comfortable and you never have to do anything by faith, one thing you're going to never check off the box is you're never going to please God because the Bible plainly says the way that we please God is by trusting in Him hearing Him, acting upon His Word. Though we don't see it, we act in faith. Well, they begin to act in faith, and they begin to do sacrifices unto the Lord. And this is what God began to do. God began to stir His people. Now, in the first six months of 2021, the beginning of it, while they were only on video, only online, not meeting together, they baptized over a thousand people. They actually had people coming to the church during the week to get baptized. They actually had people flying in from other states to that area so that they could be baptized. They were having to have staff meet them there because the staff wasn't even at church just so that they could have baptism. Over a thousand baptisms in the first six months. 
prayer meetings going on all the time. This past Monday morning, after I thought I'd messed up and unsubscribed or something, I received one of the podcasts for the first time in a month. And there's an adage. By the way, I've been a student of revival for a long, long, long time. I've read of Evan Roberts and the great revival of Wales. I've read other revivals that have happened in the world. McShane in the New England area during the pioneer days of our country. Um, George Whitfield, John Wesley. Um, what was the guy's name who, who uh, did Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God? Jonathan Edwards. Um, those men, I studied their life, the first great awakening that happened in our country right before the Revolutionary War, the second great awakening that happened in our country right before, when we had the battle uh, in the United States, the Civil War, the awakening that came before that. I've studied those things, and, and there was something that's an adage that's always been said about revival. I've heard it time and time and time again, but I really hadn't thought about it until I listened to the podcast and I was reminded of it. There's always a cost that goes with revival. And you don't get a chance to picture or pick what that cost would be. There's always a cost that goes with revival. And what happened, the way that the reason that they had delayed their podcast for a month is the pastor, Robbie, and his best friend, a fellow staff member, Chris, who were putting those podcasts together and were working together in that church, this amazing work of God, Chris walked to his driveway or to the end of his driveway where his mailbox was on July 9th and hit the ground. And by the time they found him, he was unresponsive. By the time 911 got there, the, the ambulances got there. He wasn't breathing. They could not. They did everything that they could for him. They took him to the hospital. He was still unresponsive. His eyes were set. For two days, they prayed. Sunday, as the church met together, they set up a, a time to pray Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. So they, got, they were praying for resurrection. But 24 hours later, it had been 72 hours since it happened. No response whatsoever, so they pulled the plug, and his life, he was in heaven. I think he was probably in heaven by the time he hit the ground by his mailbox. But Robbie reminded us, me of something. There's always a price to be paid for revival. I mean, there's some things in our life that we could probably say, Lord, if you'd like to have that, you could have that. Lord, I'm... I'm, I'm done using this. You can have this. Lord, uh, I don't like those folks over there too much. If you'd like to do something to them, bless them, you know. Get, get, give it all to them. But we don't get a chance to choose that. For 35 years this coming Thanksgiving, I, I had accepted God's call into the ministry. I, was, I remember exactly where I was. I was in my townhouse and I was preaching to the walls. Just me and... The crickets, probably. The next door neighbors who probably thought I was too loud. And I remember God speaking to me and I fell into my couch. And I don't know how long I sat there, but I knew God was saying to me that he wanted me to leave everything else. I was a financial planner, a stockbroker. He wanted me to leave it all behind, leave my office, and become a pastor share the good news of Jesus Christ. And I didn't want to be those, one of those people, some of you may know, the ones that give themselves over to uh, the ministry and they'll do it for a little while and then, ah, I don't really want to do this anymore. I told the Lord, I said, Lord, if I do it, I want to know that this is what you have me to do. And I said these words to him, Lord, I'll do whatever, whenever, however, to whoever. And that's been my mantra all these years is that I would do whatever he wanted me to do, whenever he wanted me to do it, however to whoever. There was no questions whatsoever. I would do it under the Lord. But I also said, Lord, would you do something for me? Two things. 
you would be so kind, would you let someone that I don't know, someone not connected with me, would you let someone come to me just to confirm that you are the one that's called me and that you really want me to be a part of the ministry? And by the way, he did that miraculously, he did that wonderfully, and I'll never forget it. I'll never forget when that person came to me and said, I don't know why I'm telling you this other than God told me to tell you. God called you to preach, and he wants you to preach. But the second thing I asked of him, I said, this was 35 years ago. I said, Lord, Lord, sometime in my ministry, I would love to see a revival. I would love to see something that's just cannot be explained away by anything other than Jesus. I would love to see something that, that cannot be confined by a church. That a pastor or a group of people could not take credit for. <coughs> something that was unmistakably God. Something that could not be contained. Something that could not be controlled. Something like you and I would look at of, as of today like a roaring wildfire that just consumes everything in its path. I was looking and I actually prayed, Lord, something that would shut businesses down. Something that would be absolutely like a tsunami of blessing to run through the schools where our children could hear about you. Something that would be a revival of the Christians and a spiritual awakening in the community for the non-believers. And I prayed that for 35 years. And I've looked for it. And I've still read of what God has done in other places. And I've told the Lord, Lord, it doesn't have to be me. I, I, I'm willing to draw that circle around myself and say, let it begin in me. But Lord, it doesn't have to be me. I just want to be there to see it happen. I want to participate. I want to feel the heat from the flames of the Holy Ghost changing lives, restoring marriages, making people filled with the peace and the happiness and the love of God. But there's a sacrifice that has to be made. And there's a price that always comes with the revival. Don't think for a second. Don't think for a, a shadow of a second that what I'm, we did out here in the front underneath the cross was a sacrifice in any way. That, that's not nothing. 29 days in, in, out there is not a sacrifice. It's nothing that can be compared to, to, to giving yourself a living sacrifice under God. And I really think we need to understand that everything needs to look against the backdrop of Jesus Christ. When we look this morning at that wafer that is a symbol of the body of Jesus Christ, as Jesus said, I am the bread of life, as Jesus said, I am the body that was broken as he took and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, symbolizing what would happen on the cross of Calvary. That juice that symbolizes the blood of Jesus Christ. Church, please listen. We're never going to understand until we get to heaven what he left behind to come to earth. We're never going to understand a place where there's only perfection and glory and love and joy and peace to come down here to be made a man and to walk through the hardship of this earth. What we call hardship is nothing compared to what he called hardship. What we look at as ministry is nothing compared to the ministry of Christ. I'll be honest with you. There are so many people that are willing for somebody else to go do the ministry. And, and ministry is an action of the heart. You either have the heart that desires to minister or you're going to do the, the, the little small part that you feel like you have to do, that you do out of fear or greed. 
or, or, or you feel like you have to do it out of responsibility, and it's not done out of love. Those who have a heart for ministry, you can't stop them. They're going to do it. They're going to be the first one in line. They're going to be the first one to, to be there and say, here I am, Lord, use me. And you can't fake that. And you know the ones that will endure for a season, but really, it's not in it. I'm here to tell you Jesus' heart was in it. He endured all the way to the cross. When they yelled at Him and screamed and cursed and mocked, He loved. When they beat Him and whipped Him, He yielded His body for them. The King of Kings, they put a robe on and a crown of thorns upon His brow. He never said a word. Nobody else could do it. Nobody else could take that sacrifice. He was the only one. He was the only one. And He was so willing. He gave so much, so willing to give, and to do it so freely. And yet he says to us, Paul said in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. By the way, which is your reasonable Service. Today, as you take of the bread and the juice, the symbol of what Christ did, remember what He did for you. Let me just ask you, what are you willing to do for Him? If you just take the top off of that wafer, top off of that and pull out that wafer. I want you to think of the night that he was with his disciples when he took that bread. How he must have felt when he blessed it. Come on now. And he broke it. And he gave it to them and said, take eat. This is my body which is broken for you. It's unleavened. It doesn't have the beautiful taste of this world. But unleavened is symbol of no sin in our life. That's what we get from Jesus. Take the bread and eat it. And do it in remembrance of Him. And He took a cup. And he looked in it and saw the wine that was there that symbolized the blood that he would shed. The blood that would drip from his feet on the cross where his feet were pierced to hold him to the cross. The blood that ran down his back where the cat of nine tails had whipped him and really ripped the skin and the tissue from his back as he endured that pain. The blood that flowed down his face where they took the crown and pressed it down upon his head and beat it down with rods. The hands that reached out to us are now pierced. Blood dripping down. Every drop symbolized what the Bible says, life is in the blood. He shed His life's blood so that we could have life to the uttermost. Eternal life. Glorious life. He took the cup and He gave it to His disciples and said, as often as you drink this, 
This is the new covenant. This is the new testament in my blood. This do in remembrance of me. Take that cup now and drink the juice. It shows the blessings of what it means to have a life with him. You know, if we're not careful, it's very easy for us to follow a symbol like we just did. Where the hard part comes when we have to walk it out every day. And I know that we don't like quiet. Matter of fact, we run from quiet. But if it's okay with you, I'd like to just take a few moments and worship before the throne in heaven where our Savior is seated. Would you just bow your heads? I want you to think of the sacrifice of what Christ has done for you. Now I want you to think What are you willing to sacrifice for Him? What are you willing to lay at the altar?